Good morning, church. Um, what a blessing to be out here at Redemption Ranch this morning. We are having one united worship service as we kick off our impact week. We're still talking about love where you live. So glad that we can be gathered together, united, both our services meeting together here at Redemption Ranch. Um, I'm so glad we got to worship the Lord through song this morning. I want to also encourage you that we can worship God through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And you can give online through our app or through our website, or you can mail in your tithe or offering. We're just so glad that we can give um, to God. We give our lives to the Lord. We also give our finances to him because everything is his. We're going to be looking back in the book of Matthew. We're actually going to be going all the way to chapter 11 today as we've done this series, Love Where You Live, where we've started talking about how God has placed us here in St. Louis County for a reason, in Bridgeton for a reason, that there is a reason why God wants us to be a light in our community. And so we know it says in Jeremiah that, man, when we're living as exiles somewhere, that we want to pursue the good of that community because when it prospers, then we prosper. That's why we say here at Fifi that. We want to build our lives on Jesus. We stand on that firm foundation. He is our cornerstone, but we also pursue the good of our community all for the glory of God. And that's what impact week is all about. Pursuing the good of our community. Last year we gave uh, 458 and a half hours in one week to our community, local missions hours. And we want to see if we can um, meet or even exceed that goal um, this week. And so we're out here at Redemption Ranch to kick off Impact Week. And so we can fellowship together and then encourage one another to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Um, I hope you had some time to turn to Matthew chapter 11. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at John the Baptist and some questions that he had for Jesus. You know, remember, we looked at how Jesus was going around preaching and teaching. Then he told his disciples, here's the problem. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Then he starts off by telling them just a couple of weeks ago, we looked at how he said, so what we do is we pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. And then what we know is what happened in chapter 10 is we had a transition that Jesus said, you're no longer just my disciples. You're not just learning, but now you're my apostles. You're being sent out by me to go and to serve and to teach and to preach the good news of the kingdom. So this, there's this idea that we pray for revival, but we don't just pray that we let God stir in our hearts and we go out and God and in his infinite wisdom has chosen to use us, to use the church, to answer those prayers of sending out workers into the harvest. But now I want to see why it's so important for us to stay on mission for God. And we're going to look at what John the Baptist is thinking is, and is, is experiencing in the midst of all of this. So if you have your Bible, I hope you turn to John chapter 11. I want to read just verses one through six. And this is what God's word says. It says, when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. Now, when John heard in prison what the Christ was doing, he sent a message through his disciples and he asked him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied to them, go and report to John what you hear and see the blind receive their sight, the lame walk. Those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised and the poor are told the good news and blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're so thankful for your word. God, I pray that we would be able to go Lord, and tell people what you have done for us, that they would be able to see Lord from the proclamation of your word, that they'd be able to see Lord through the demonstration of your word, 
the reality of who you are and what you've done for us. So we pray Lord for the next few moments, God, that you turn our minds, attention, our hearts, affection to you and to your word. God, I pray that we, your church would be living proof of who you are. It's in your son's name. We pray and all God's people said, amen. So here we step into this story and John the Baptist is in prison. And let's just ask for a few moments. Just think about expectations versus reality. Expectations versus reality. My wife loves to order things off of Amazon, but there are times when she's trying to get a new dress and she sees one that looks perfect on the model on Amazon. And when it comes in the mail, it doesn't look anything like it. Sometimes the reality does not meet expectations. Or, you know, I was, I was talking with Kyle and he gave me a hard time, but it's actually true. We have these very high expectations, Cowboys fans, every single year. I think it's going to be 1995 all over again, but it hasn't happened yet. Expectations, Cowboys make it to the Super Bowl. Reality, something goes wrong. That happens, or I think, you think, man, I'm going to have kids and they're going to be perfect angels. And then they become toddlers. I can still distinctly remember Caleb throwing a fit and bawling at our kitchen table in Texas. It was the middle of summer. He had on his snow hat, um, his, his snow gloves, his snow boots, and he was losing his mind because God wasn't sending snow. That toddler logic, right? Expectations versus reality. We've all kind of gone through that. And this is what John the Baptist, quite frankly, is going through. You see, with John the Baptist, he goes out and he's preaching how he looks at Jesus and says, behold, the Lamb of God who's taking away the sins of the world. And John the Baptist, like many of the religious leaders in that day, they thought the Messiah was going to come and was going to remove Rome from power. That the Messiah was going to come and bring sweeping change and he was going to be an earthly king. And John the Baptist had put his life on the line, preaching and proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. And here we are in Matthew chapter 11. And John the Baptist has been languishing in prison. He had these incredible expectations. And the reality is that he's in prison. Awaiting his impending execution. And in this moment, John the Baptist is struggling with doubt. And so he sends two of his disciples to go and see Jesus. And they ask Jesus this question. They say, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we're waiting for? Or is there someone else? John the Baptist saying, did I get this wrong? This is not what I was expecting. And look at what Jesus says in response to John the Baptist. He says, go and report to John. Listen to these two things, what you hear and what you see. So Jesus's answer to John the Baptist doubt, Jesus's answer, I would say to the struggles of this world. He says, go tell John what you see and what you hear. And then what, what Jesus says is he actually quotes, uh, he alludes to Isaiah, both Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. When he says this, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised and the poor are told the good news. So he quotes from Isaiah, Jesus does. And what he tells us is John, the proof is out here. Not only am I preaching the good news to the poor, not only proclaiming the truth of the gospel, like was predicted back in Isaiah about the Messiah, but you know, all throughout, you can read the entire Old Testament and not once is someone who's blind healed of that blindness and been given sight. And yet Jesus is doing that. Another sign of the Messiah. So he's alluding to Isaiah, reminding John of that. And he's just telling these disciples at this moment, just go tell them what you've seen and what you've heard. You know, when you're talking about proof 
of who Jesus is and what he's done. You know, right now I'm teaching systematic theology for Midwestern Seminary. And so we could walk through a whole, Jesus could have gone all through Christology and shown how he is the person of Christ, how he's 100% man and 100% God. He could have walked through all those different things, but Jesus doesn't give a, a systematic theology for why he is the Christ. He simply says this. He says, go tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. And so Jesus has answered a doubt. As we think about why we're going out and doing impact week, this is what Jesus is telling us. This is how we respond to doubt. This is how we respond to the struggles in this world. We need gospel proclamation. We need to go tell the good news. Go tell the good news. We also need gospel demonstration. We need to live out the good news. So with our lips and with our lives, we are proclaiming to people that Jesus really is who he says he is, that we get to be living proof of the gospel. What are those implications for us? If you think about it, we, very simply, we are, the Bible tells us, Jesus' hands and feet. He's chosen us, his church, to advance his kingdom. We go into a doubting world. We go into an unbelieving world and we proclaim the truth. We don't just proclaim the truth. We also demonstrate the truth. If you think it says this in, in, in 1 Peter, and this is really why I want to conclude this morning. In 1 Peter 2, as, as Peter's describing the church, he says this. He says, as you come to him, speaking of Jesus, a living stone rejected by people, but chosen honor by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So let, Peter says that we are living stones and this is what we do as living stones. Verse nine, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says, it's our job as living stones. We're being built up as Jesus's hands and feet to go out and share with others the good news of the gospel. It doesn't stop there. Look at verses 11 and 12. Peter issues a call to good works. He says, dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. Listen to this. So that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. It says when we conduct ourselves honorably, when we go out and we do good in our community, it says that these Gentiles, these people who don't even know who Jesus is are going to glorify God because of how we live. So as we think about that, it's an incredible opportunity that we have. It's also an incredible responsibility that we have to go and live in such a way that people look at what we're doing. They're saying, you know what? We might not believe everything that they believe, but there's something about what they're doing. And as we demonstrate the gospel with our good works throughout impact week, I also pray that we'd look for opportunities then to proclaim the gospel, to share with people why we're doing what we're doing. We want to open up those conversations. And as we serve in our community, I pray that we can turn those everyday conversations into gospel conversations. A lot of people have unmet expectations when it comes to their lives. They're dealing with a sinful, broken world. It's been very difficult. And what we can do is we can step in just like Jesus did to his cousin, John the Baptist. And we can say, Jesus really is who he says he is. He loves you so much. And we're going to proclaim that truth that Jesus loved the world so much. He died on the cross for our sins. And we're going to demonstrate the reality of that by going out and being on mission for him. Not just during impact week. But for the rest of our lives, we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus because we are living proof 
of the gospel. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're so thankful for your son. We're so thankful for the hope that we have in him. God, I pray if there's anyone here who's struggling with doubt, who's dealing with the reality of a sinful, broken world. If there's anyone that we're going to encounter this next week, God, we pray that you'd be working on their hearts, ministering to them. And God, I pray for each and every one of us. I pray, Lord, that we can go out. Lord, and we can proclaim the gospel. And we can demonstrate the gospel and share your truth with the lost and dying world. So God, we pray that you'd go before us. We pray, God, that you would use us. And God, let us be a light in our community and around the world. We love you. And we're thankful for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.